Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Josh Epstein. I am the marketing specialist here at TDA Perks. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, our webinar is PPP and dentistry, the K95 and N95 math, sorting out the differences. Rose Dodson is the CEO and founder of Longtime Perks Vendor, Sedation Resource, and she's our pre presenter today. Rose is an innovator and an entrepreneur with over 20 years in business leadership. She's experienced in all aspects, business formation, operation, finance, and management. Additionally, she's a visionary product developer and equipment specialist. I want to add that Rose frequently provides TDA Perks with educational content, such as our journal articles. She's a frequent presenter here uh, during our monthly webinars, and she also speaks on a national level the topic of sedation. Some have probably seen her at TDA meeting. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and I am going to answer questions as they come at the end of the presentation. If we don't have enough time to get to all the questions, I'll have them, um, you can just still type them in and I'll forward them right to Rose and we can get them answered. So appreciate you being with us. Again, TDA Perks, we endorse over 25 vendors uh, that are there to help your practice um, from OSHA HIPAA compliance to insurance, HR and personnel management, e-prescribing, marketing, and more. Um, be sure to take advantage of our articles and our webinars. All our podcasts are in the resource section of our website, tdaperks.com. And again, I'm Josh Epstein. My email is jepstein at tda.org. So you can reach out to me at any time. And phone number at TDA is 512-443-3675. And I'm at extension 161. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'm going to pass. Or Rose, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, thank God it's Friday. Uh, I know that this is probably going to be listened on other days, but those of you that are with me, you're probably glad to have the weekend in front of you. So I want to just start by saying today is April 24th, 2020. We are in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's amazing to me that um, a week, a day, everything, it seems to be different as we go along. I did a, a short video back earlier in the month and I thought, well, hey, I'll just use that video because I've already got all that content. I'll just replay it. But in three weeks, the information has changed. So it's like, okay, well, we, we need to go back and look at where we're at today. So, um, you know, it does change. I know many of you are um, in the middle of this. We're six weeks in now. I think we're in the sixth week where your offices have been closed or you're only seeing emergency patients. And this is just an unprecedented time that we're in. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready for it to all be over with for sure. Um, we actually, if you don't know much about our company, our focus has been entirely on sedation. Like Josh said, um, I've been around about 20 years in the sedation market. I've had my company for about 15 years. And our focus has been on monitors, equipment for sedation, emergency stuff. That's where we've always looked at. And so since we are 95% is what I said before, but now I think we're more like 98% when the phone stopped ringing, everybody left their offices. Uh, we are real, really, really, really committed to the dental, uh, dental market. And so every phone call that we were getting though in those first few weeks was, do you have N95 masks? Do you have N95 masks? Do you have N95 masks? And so, a red flag went up to us that there was an issue going on and that there might be something that we could do to help alleviate the problem. So as we were taking those calls, I started looking at all of our suppliers and seeing what we might be able to do. We found a few uh, from one supplier that quickly ran, up, ran out within just a day or so and they were very expensive. And so we started digging a little deeper and that's what led me on this path to discovery about all of the N95 masks, what's out there, what's available, and, and hopefully I can help you sort out some of those di differences. Um, I don't know about you, but prior to all this, I barely knew what an N95 mask was. You know, so it's it's been a learning experience for sure, um, trying to sort through all the different regulations, 
when things would change. It seemed like there in the beginning that there was one rule one day and then the rule changed the next day. I think we kind of have hit a little plateau on the rules changing. So hopefully we can dig in and um, get right to the point. I want to say that I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice. So I'm not associated with any regulatory department. So if you have questions and you want to get down to, to those types of things, you need to seek your attorney. All of my information will be from my own experience and my own opinion. So PPE and dentistry, what will be the new norm? You know, you look at this image here of Dr. Halusik um, and his staff there with their PPE on. Will this be the new norm? I honestly don't know. All that I know is today, today we are in a contingency crisis mode and we need to be able to protect ourselves, protect our patients, protect our staff. So we want to learn what it takes to do that. And um, that's where we are. What will be tomorrow, we'll have to see. You'll notice these um, helmets that they have on, the shields they have on. These are nothing more than something that you can get at your welding supply. So if you're looking to get those, that's where I would start. Now take a look at this. Can you believe that every one of these masks are actually N95 masks? Every one. They come in different shapes, colors. Um, they have different levels of, um, of protectiveness. And we're going to talk about all of that. We were going to go over what the ADA advice is in this, the management during this crisis mode. We'll talk about the definition of N95. And I want to talk to you about fit tests and seal tests, the legitimate and the counterfeit. And then we'll talk about availability and where you can expect to find masks for your staff. The algorithm that the ADA put out it was is actually how to figure out what patients you need to manage during the COVID-19 pandemic and how to get that, how to treat them in the lowest risk possible. So I'm not going to go into all of that algorithm, but what I do want to point out is that what they actually advised for the lowest risk um, was for you and your staff to have N95 respirators that were fitted to your face. At first, when I looked at this, I didn't, I didn't know if they really meant for you to have a fit test. We're going to talk about that later. Um, but it seemed to me that it would be very extreme if you had to actually have them fitted because that's a, another, a whole different scenario of having them fitted to your face. But we'll talk about what that means. But they do recommend that if you want the very lowest risk. But what I want to also point out um, before, before we get to the next slide, let me go here. So there's a little asterisk at the bottom of that page. Let me just go back. So you see there at the bottom, seems like there's always an asterisk. So let's talk about the asterisk on this page. So a less protective option than N95 respirators is the use of a surgical face mask with a full face shield. So that is one way. Now there is an option there for um, using a surgical face mask with a face shield. But what they're telling you is that using a surgical face mask with a face shield is less protective than an N95. It doesn't say that it's not protective. It's just less protective. So if you have a surgical face mask and you can use it with a face shield, you're still going to be protected. It's just not quite as much. And as I go on to explain the full meaning of N95, hopefully you'll be able to see that even an N95 is not complete 100% protection. So let's talk about what an N95 is and is not. And I want to show you this page because you'll see here, this is April 2020. So early in April, they put out this guidance and this is the latest of the guidance. You'll see they started this on March 25th and they kind of weeble wobble between the 25th and the 3rd on what they were going to accept and whose mask they were going to accept, but they got it all ironed out. So the next few definitions that I'm going to talk to you about came directly from this document um, that, that was put out on beginning March 25th, but then amended on April the 3rd, and they have not changed it since April the 3rd. So a 
N95 respirator, we call it a mask, but it's actually a respirator, is regulated under the CFR 878-4040. And you'll see here, actually, there's three, two different regulations that it's regulated under. And I wanted to point that out. It is a respirator with an antimicrobial antiviral agent. You know, your normal surgical masks are also under the same classification. And secondly, here's another N95 respirator, and it's also under the same antimicrobial antiviral. So now we have a third one. The difference in these two at the bottom, you'll notice, is that instead of being a medical device, they're actually just for use by the general public in public health emergencies. So they are the same type, uh, but they're just rated a different way. Now there's also an asterisk at the bottom of that page that we were looking at, and that is where the FDA recognizes that when alternatives such as the FDA cleared mask or respirators are not available, that you can improvise. So I know we are, we've heard about people making their own mask and I, that is great, you know, and that's what we need to be doing as the general public, I believe, is saving the medical mask for the healthcare professionals such as yourself and allowing the general population to use something that they don't need as much protection. So keep calm and improvise. So I thought you might get a little kick out of this. So I'm not sure that I wanna put a water bottle on my head, but if worse comes to worse, there are some options there for you. Okay, so definitions. I'm not going to read all these definitions. You know what a face mask is, a surgical mask, but what I want to point out here is the filtering face piece respirator, the FFR. That is what we're talking about here is a filtering face piece respirator, the true definition of an N95. So here again, these are definitions straight from that document. I didn't get these out of the dictionary. This came straight from the FDA document. So the N equals not resistant to oil, and the 9.5 is filtration efficacy of at least 95% of particulate materials. And so that is, all of these are under the uh, 42 CFR 84181. So you have a standard N95 respirator, you have a NIOSH approved N95 respirator, and you have a surgical N95 respirator. And they are all regulated under that same classification. The difference in the top one and the bottom one here is that they have a secondary um, FDA regulation that puts them into a class two device. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. So surgical N95 class two medical devices, that's what a surgical N95 is. So just to go back to the screen, you see the top N95 respirator, and then you see the surgical N95 respirator. These can be exactly the same, have the exact same uh, manufacturer, but if it's a surgical N95 respirator, then it's actually regulated as a class two medical device. So I was trying to figure out how to sort out, you know, we're hearing their NIOSH approved, but the FDA approved them and then OSHA regulates it. So I had to break it down for myself. And basically the FDA regulates the entities and the manufacturers and they're saying, okay, you know, you can, you know, they're gonna make sure the manufacturer's all in order. They have the proper paperwork and all of that stuff and are functioning in, within their legal guidelines. And so then you have the NIOSH and they regulate the actual product. So how it's made, if it's tested, all of that stuff. Then the OSHA actually regulates the user of the device or how it's used. So you, know, you don't even realize how many people use an N95 mask, but they are used in, in, indust in industries as dust masks all across um, the, the world. Um, not only that, but your food and health industry, any, anywhere that there's some sort of a dust particulate that could actually be breathed in, that's where an N95 mask is used. You'll notice that this particular gentleman has on an N95 mask and it has a little port on the outside, which makes it a lot easier to breathe with. And that's great, but I do want to point out while we're looking at this that that, that little filter 
while it protects you because it nothing can come in still as you breathe out it does not protect everyone else around you because you are still breathing out your so if you're sick that's not the best thing for you to wear if you're sick you need to wear something that does not have one of those filters on it so then we get down to the centers of disease uh, control the cdc and you know they're the director of everybody in the in the middle of a pandemic so that's why everybody keeps referring back to the cdc referring back to the cdc but normally you might be just like well osha requires me to do this because we're all kind of guided by osha too but the cdc is like the be all and end all for what you've got to do so i wanted to uh, point out march the third and this is an important note niosh approved authorized for industrial use in 95s were approved for healthcare providers on march the third so we were in the middle of the pandemic there were shortages in ppe i mean shortages in these masks in particular and they're like hey we've got a ton of these masks that are in our warehouse why can't they be used so that's what happened and that's great but what it did was it, it kind of muddied the waters in the medical world because now you don't know if you're getting a surgical N95 mask or you're just getting a dust mask that you you know have out in your shop so there's a little bit of a kind of uncertainty there and that's what we're trying to sort out is hey what do i really need to be doing and how can i best be protected and it's fine if you're not in a situation where you're right uh, next to a, a moisture situation blood and um spit and slob or whatever you're not in that situation you don't really are not as concerned about a surgical grade you're just worried about the air but if you're in more of a moisture environment you definitely want to have uh, something that will protect you so with a surgical n95 respirator it is there to protect the healthcare provider that is the biggest thing in this pandemic though if you are sick you want to make sure you're also protecting uh, those that are around you so it in protecting the healthcare provider it needs to be fluid resistant to droplets blood body fluids and secretions so i wanted to point this out also i know i'm pointing out a lot of stuff i need to quit saying that all the time but the point is that you are already wearing a face mask as a dentist or a hygienist and you're very familiar with these levels level one level two level three and if you will look here you do have 95 percent filtration of bacterial and now these all are different microns they're not quite as good as the um, n95 but you have the fluid resistant levels here so in my mind if you can you know get a n95 mask or we'll talk about in a moment a kn95 mask that you at least know you're getting that efficacy of filtration for the for the virus and you put a surgical mask over it then that will help you with that fluid resistance part so keep in mind what the whole purpose of this is um fluid, you know you want to protect yourself and you want to manage your risk so what does managing risk mean how can we manage our risk does it mean everyone in the office needs to wear an N95 mask in order to be completely risk-free? First off, an N95 mask is only 95% effective. So there's nothing that's 100%. We're all trying to gear up to go back to work. We're trying to get the proper PPE. It's in shortage. You know, we're gonna have to do what we can to be able to get back into gear. And, you know, even to the, the gowns, you know, that you're gonna need to wear the gowns there's not necessarily disposable gowns that you're used to buying for two dollars and 19 cents for a pack of 10 you know 50 cents a piece that's just not available today and you might need to consider getting something that you can throw in the laundry and wash uh, every night i mean there's just going to be ways that you're going to have to make do and get through the situation until we can sort out a better supply chain for all of the ppe I thought that the ADA did an incredible job at putting together the interim mask and face shield guidelines. And I wanted to point this out. I'm not gonna go over all of their guidelines, but I wanna point out two links to you that are on this page. So when you go to the ADA, um, there is an understanding of the mask types and also um, the FDA 
list there of different suppliers. So um, the N95 is what we're used to hearing about, but there are equivalent masks from different countries that are also acceptable at this time. So the KN95 and then the, the different levels there we'll talk about as we go along. So um, the coronavirus disease and what we are at right now is we are in the crisis capacity strategies during a known shortage. There is a known shortage. And so with that known shortage being there, um, respirators that are approved under standards of use by other countries that are similar to NEOS approved uh, filtering face piece respirators can also be used. I want to say this right now because we're in a known shortage and many of us have asked when will this shortage be over when will we be done with this shortage and it is such an unknown but i have talked to some of the main suppliers within the industry and honestly we need to be looking at probably fall or even after before our regular supply chains are opened back up because everything is still going to be going into the hospitals. And someone put this into perspective for me. They said, in Europe, um, to treat one COVID-19 patient, it takes 15 N95 masks per day. And if they have 700,000 people that they're treating, that is over 10 million masks per day in Europe alone. So think about that. And this is why we're facing this. We're facing the shortages. It's very difficult to get a hold of any type of mask. And so it's important that we find a way and understand what our channels are to be able to get the supplies that we need and who that we can reach out to to be able to help us. So during this entire um, FDA look back on this this April document that I'm pulling all this from. This was another page in there and it gave us the list of other countries. And I thought, oh wow, we could we could find something in one of these countries. You know, surely Korea or Brazil or someone might have a mask. And this was a huge, huge eye opener to me. Of all of these people, the only one on this list that I was able to find anything from is China. Then we go on to the, the FDA went on to help us a little further and they actually have a list of other companies that are on there that are FDA approved. And you may have seen this list already. There are, that list has been growing and there are over 80 companies. I, I think maybe 90, I didn't count exactly. Even all of these masks, that are the FF2s, uh, PFF2s in Brazil, all of these different ones, every single one has a manufacturer on there of made in China. That's who the manufacturer is, so everything. So we've got this huge backlog of everything, everybody trying to get their mask from China. So Australia, Europe, Brazil, everybody all at one time is needing this. So hopefully that kind of opens your, eye, your mind as to why there's such an overrun of masks and why they're so hard to get. And um, it's important when you are able to get them to secure them. I'm not trying to create a run on masks, but I want you to understand why there's such a big issue because it's not just the United States that needs these masks. Every other country in the world needs these masks to treat this pandemic. So we're looking at here, these are three of the main um, CDC groups for three major company, uh, or companies, countries. So you've got the European Center, we know about the CDC for the N95, then you have the FFP1, 2, and 3 of Europe. Um, and so the one is just a simple dust mask, it's not going to do really what you need it to do. If you're going to go with a European number, the CE mark is on Europe. and so. Then you have the CDC in China, and that's the KN95. So one of the things about all of the people that are on this FDA list that I talked about here, what happened was in March, when they made the 
the exception and said it was, well, yeah, it was March, that first date in March when they made the exception and said, okay, now you can um, utilize N95s from other, or equivalents from other countries. So they said in order to be accepted by the FDA, that you had to either present that you um, were recognized by another governing body. So if, if a company, in other words, in China had already obtained their CE mark certification, they could present that to the FDA and that would get them cleared. If they didn't have that, then they had to present a testing documentation and then that's how they would get cleared. Honestly, I wondered how some of them even got on the list. One, this is kind of funny, but one of the names of the companies is something like Daddy's Baby or something. Anyway, I thought it was funny. I, I can't pronounce most of the names, but I could read that one. So uh, at any rate, I just want you to see the differences in the, the CE mark versus only KN95. It is regulated by the GB2626, and there is one other level but they don't talk about it a lot and I'm not sure why and I'm not going to go into it that much in this presentation but I have done extensive research on it and the KN95 has a uh, GB19083 that gives you a surgical grade uh, authorization and it is more antipermeable to blood and fluids but those are not really out on the market so NIOSH counterfeits if I've gotten one call I've gotten a thousand you know, and everybody just wants to make sure they're not being duped. I want to make sure I'm not being duped. Oh my goodness. Um, think about trying to supply enough for um, everyone versus, you know, just a case or a box. It's a big, heavy burden to try to figure out what is a counterfeit and what is not. So NIOSH counterfeits. So for something to be a counterfeit, it doesn't mean that it's not a legitimate respirator. It simply means in the NIOSH document that these are not NIOSH approved. And we are in a different world right now. We are not able to get NIOSH approved N95s. They're like the unicorn. I'm serious. They're just not out there. And so we're going to have to look beyond that. And let's look at what do we do to find a legitimate mask that is not NIOSH approved. So all, while all of these masks are not NIOSH approved, it doesn't mean that they're not a legitimate mask. It doesn't mean that they're not an effective mask. So I'm gonna walk you through um, what that is like to look at a, a how, how to tell if your mask is legitimate uh, versus you know, just NIOSH counterfeit. So we wanna make sure that we get a good mask, but it's not necessarily going to be NIOSH approved. <clears throat> Now, as far as when does this clear up, I don't, I don't know when it clears up and we are able to get NIOSH approved. Um, like I said, I know that the supply chain of just normal supplies is, is not set to clear anytime soon. So we're going to need to think about what do we got to do today? How do we get our PPE today? What is available today and what can we use? So how to tell if a mask is legitimate? So you'll see here these four levels, and this is the type of levels that are in all masks, whether it is the N95 or the KN95. And there is a secret ingredient here, this melt blown cloth, that is the key to the mask, is that's what helps it to be efficient in filtering the bacteria. So a few things, now of course you can't do this while you're looking on the internet trying to find a mask. But once you get it in your hand, you can test to see if it's, if it's good and if it's working well. So test number one, if you have your mask on and you have a flame in front of you, a lighter or something, you can try to blow out the flame. If you can blow it out, then it is not a good mask because that meltdown cloth should be protecting you and you should not be able to blow out very effectively. The next test is to the smell of sweet and low. So if you should still be able to still smell it faintly through the mask, but you should not be able to smell it like prominently. Then the, the third test is a droplet test. And this can be performed in two ways. I watched the test online and it, it basically even for your normal surgical mask, you can do these same tests because they, um, 
work in much the same way. But just dropping water on the top of the mask, if it absorbs straight into the mask, then that's not a very good mask. If it beads up on the top of the mask, then that is a better mask. The other thing is, is you can turn your mask upside down and pour water into it and then see if any moisture comes out on the other side. So those are some tests to see how good your mask is. Flammability test, this is obviously something you don't wanna do when it's on your face, but you can take that, that inner layer of that and if you light that mask, it should melt and not flame. There should be no flame on the mask whatsoever. So these are some of the tests that they actually do before the mask gets approved anyway. But if you're really curious whether or not your mask is doing what it should do, and if it's legitimate, these are some things that you can do to ease your mind on whether or not you have a, a legitimate mask. Okay, so the next thing where it, when it comes to masks is fitting them. And thank God they have waived the fit test because that was somewhat of an ordeal. That little thing on the guy's head in this picture, um, basically you put that hood over your face. There's a couple of different ways that they do this, but that's about a $200 gadget there. And then you have to have someone else do the test. They have a couple of ways to do it, but they can spray an odor inside the test. And if you've got your mask on, if you can smell it without the mask and then you smell it with the mask and that's how you can tell if it fits you or not. But what you want to do is at least do a seal check each time. And these instructions tell you how to do it. It's pretty simple. You put the mask on and if you have an overhead strap, you can see here on number three, she's putting the one strap all the way back below her ear and then the second strap goes above her ear. And then you hold, uh, you press down the metallic piece on your nose. That's very important that you get a good seal with that metallic piece around your nose. There should be a foam piece on the inside and that helps just to seal that around your nose. And when you put both of your hands up over your mask, and you inhale and exhale sharply, you should be able to tell if you have leaks around it. And if you do have leaks and you wanna adjust your straps. And I wanna to talk to you about how to do that with an ear loop mask, we'll come to that in a minute. I know this is a lot of information and we're sorting through a lot of things, but I have to give you this word of caution. People with chronic respiratory, cardiac, or other medical conditions that make breathing difficult should check with their healthcare provider before using an N95 respirator because the N95 respirator can make it more difficult for the wearer to breathe. This is hugely important. You need to make sure that you are clear from your healthcare provider to use N95 if you have asthma, if you have other conditions that affect your breathing. Proper fit is so important. You'll notice in number two, I just want to reiterate this again. It's very important that you seal that uh, metal part down around your nose. That is where you're, you get a lot of air uh, leakage at around your nose there. So you want to make sure that that is sealed. I found that putting it on your, your chin first and then putting it up to your nose is, is the best way to get a really good fit on that as well. So what is available now? Unfortunately, and you can search the world over, but they're all unicorns that you're seeing on this page. And, you know, not only are they very expensive, you just can't find them. They're just not out there. What's being used is being sent directly to the hospital. I tried to source some of these from a US manufacturer and he said, you know, they're not taking new customers for one thing. And he, and he wrote me back. He said, but I'm, I'm willing to talk to you. He's like, our backlog is so, so big. He's like, we will not be able to get cleared probably until the end of the year. So they have orders. So the U.S. manufacturers are really working hard to get it done. And I know there are some things going on where they have other people that are going to be making masks. But all of this takes time. And this i'm speaking to the dental community i'm not a political person this is not politicized at all and i'm just going to speak to you straight to get these other um, 
people in the United States up and running to be able to make masks for us so that we can take this back into our own country is going to take some time. It's a lot easier to say, I'm going to make a mask than it is to get the equipment there to retool everything that you're usually doing to be able to, to make the mask and make it um, where it's approved to be a N95 mask. I'm being told that some of these factories will not be up and running until August. So we're all still in this, this phase where we're trying to get masks out of another country. And it's not just the making of the masks now that's an issue, but it's that wonderful little uh, piece of material there that makes it so great. There's been a shortage in that material. And so we have to also gear up making that material here, not just getting that material from another country. So there's lots of steps that have to be done here. So what you're going to find is you're going to be looking at an ear hook style KN95. Unfortunately, that is all that is out there. If you find something different, grab it, keep it, don't tell your friends. <laughs> um, but that is what's available now. And I don't see this really shifting gears, really probably not this year. So where to buy this uh, and how to know that you're not getting um, so, something that's not legitimate. All of your dental suppliers, you know, myself, Patterson, Shine, Benco, anybody that you can think of that is a local reputable supplier, you know, the TDA supply site, everyone wants to try to get something that is on the FDA approved list. None of us want to just go buy something off of eBay and try to sell it to our dental community. So I think if you stay within a reputable supplier that you know, get on their back order list, um, they're going to do everything that they can to vet the company and the product because you have to understand if they're buying this product, they have to put up 100% to be able to get, there's no 30 day, uh, 30 day account, and you can buy a couple hundred thousand masks and you can pay us in 30 days. That's not happening in this situation. If you're going to buy masks somewhere, you're going to pay, you're going to wire the money 100% up front. And that's how it is. And you know how it is when you go online and you see these companies that have these masks. And that's why Google took this offline because people are going to try N95 masks and you're placing your order with these companies thinking you're going to get a mask in a week or two weeks and it's not happening and you've already given your money and there's so many refunds. So they've just taken it down. And I think that the point is, is you need to be reaching out to those people in your, in your supply chain. Hopefully you've made some friends out there um, and you haven't, you know, kind of burned any bridges because People are getting a little bit of a supply. It's just very slow and coming. So they, they're doing their best to help you. It's just, it's more than any one of us can handle. It's basically taken all of us together to really make a difference. So other resources that you can go to, I know we're gonna to get to questions here in a minute, but I wanted to point out the TDA website does have a really good update area for resources. You can go there, check out their website. They've got uh, a COVID-19 update and resources page there. Um, that's where you'll find links to the ADA site as well. You can go there as a landing page. And then from there, you can uh, go and see what other pages are available through the ADA. We have also set up a couple of things to try to reach out. I have updates. Um, you can text PPE to this number. This is a texting app that I have set up so that as we get available PPE, I will update everyone accordingly. Once we finally get the mask in that are on order, if you've placed an order, we're working very hard to get that filled. I did send out a little message update on that today. If you didn't get your message about your order, text uh, PPE to that number and you will get that update. It's, it's a lot to keep up with. It's like I said, it's more than one company can handle. It's more than one sales rep can handle. It is a lot of information. Everybody needs this. Everybody wants to go back to work. Everybody needs a mask of some kind. And, and we are all having a very difficult time getting them to land on our doorstep in any number. So um, there's a Facebook group also, PPE and Dentistry. We're trying to just get the community together. Let's talk about it. Let's share. Um, 
different information about where facials are available. What are you doing to make your own? You know, some person was on there. He hired his seamstress to make his gowns. He had he followed the CDC guidelines for gowns. I thought that was very innovative. He's like paying 45 bucks for someone to make them, but they're reusable and they're his to keep. So we're all in this together. We're going to get through this. It's a little daunting at times, but we will get through it. We will we will work through every bit of it. And in the end, we'll have a much better stable supply chain, I think, than we've had in the past because we're going to bring a lot of our stuff back to the home front in the coming days and weeks. So thank you so much for your time. And I think we're going to take some questions. Josh, I'll give it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Rose. Um, ladies and gentlemen, just please type your questions into the box there um, in your panel, and I'll be happy to relay them over to Rose. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any coming in yet. Okay. Okay, so we're just going to wait. That means I did my job really longer. well, right? Yes, ma'am. That was great. Hopefully we covered most of that. Um, I, I, there was one question I was thinking, I think I did put a slide in there about it. Uh, I just wanted everybody to know that where they can have resources to turn to. So, okay, actually I've got, I've got one coming uh, in through, uh, through right now. I'm sorry, Rose. Okay. So uh, this is from uh, Dr. Carroll here. I see some others coming up too. Thanks everyone. Uh, what about sources for face shields? Sources for face shields, uh, yeah. right. So I know that there are some people that are doing that on the 3D printers and they're using their, they're using like a, a clear plastic cover. That's not necessarily the best way to go, but I know that we are in the loop to get some in. I, I'm at a point right now though, I don't wanna sell anything until it's landing and sitting on my dock. So I would say reach out to your suppliers. They should be they should be getting those in soon. I know ours are scheduled. We have we have one uh, manufacturer that is is in the U.S. and we are scheduled to get some of those in the first week of May. And then we have another order from an, an international source that will also be coming in around the same time. So. Again, if you will text PPE to that number, as we even if it's through another source, we'll give you that source for face shields, and we'll just—it's not an interactive texting group. It's just something that's going to be informative to you. Sometimes I get on there and answer back, but a lot of times it's just information to you to be able to get that. And also go onto that PPE and dentistry. Um, you can sort, you know, look at the face shield chat that's gone on and several people have given um, places that you can buy them where they've gotten them from and there's some some uh, conversation about that i have tried to monitor that if someone um, tries to put up an advertisement or something like that i'm i'm taking that down i don't have it set to uh, have advertising going through that group so we're trying to just keep it more organic and more from the dental community speaking to one another so that's a good place to go and see if anyone else is putting up resources. Okay, and I've got a, a second part to that question here, I believe. So uh, will the face shield have to be disposed of after each patient? Um, yes and no. It's just like everything else, it's gonna be marked single patient use. It will need to be clean. So if you're going to use it for the next patient, you know they're saying that you need to you need to clean it or to clean it at the end of the day and i've heard some people are using cavi wipes you know whatever your normal protocol is to clean something like that like you're cleaning a a monitor or you want to you want to be gentle with it i would think you would not want to use a really harsh chemical so and test it on a certain area of the face shield as long as you can clean it i don't see a reason why you can't reuse it we are in a contingency mode, and I know I've said that a bazillion times. At this point, you need to do whatever you've got to do to minimize your risk. And if you've only got five face shields and you can rotate them out, clean those things. Don't don't dispose of them for sure. Okay, uh, I've got a question here from Dr. Silva. Uh, what do you know about reusable 
N95 masks. That's another topic for um, that we were going was going on in that group. Um, they're really not made to be reused. There are some that the government has authorized a sterilization process to be done by a certain sterilization machine that are in the hospitals. But I believe that takes a certain type of mask. Now, there was discussion that you can heat up a mask to 170 degrees and that will sterilize it. There's also talk about a UV sterilizer that could work. Do not, I do not recommend autoclave. That will break down that, anything with heat like that will break down that melt down fabric that I discussed. So keeping that in mind, if you, you it may look okay on the outside, but you will have destroyed that meltdown fabric if you heat it too too hot. And that's why even heating it to 170 degrees, you know, you've got to be very careful and be very precise about that. The one thing is um, we know that over time the virus, you know, will dissipate. And they talk about taking a mask and putting it in a paper bag and letting it sit over a period of time, I, I want to say 24 hours. So if you can imagine having maybe a number of masks and rotating out of the, the paper bag, then you can feel a little more assured that if there's anything in those in the mask that, that it would have dissipated at that point. So those are some things that you can think about in the contingency phase. I think, you know, once the mask has been soiled or those types of things, you obviously need to think about getting rid of them. A lot of people are talking about using, I referred to this earlier, but using a regular medical mask on top of the N95 mask to let them make them last longer. So nothing's going to destroy that inside of that mask just by you breathing on it. Um, it's going to take heat and, you know, t over time it would probably wear out, but you should be able to essentially use it more than once, just keeping it sterilized, not sterilized, but like I said, rotating it out. I know when our boxes come in here to the warehouse, we have a policy that they sit for 24 hours before we open them, just because we you know, read that contaminants can last on a box for 24 hours. So just some precautions that we're taking and you want to think about that for your mask and things that you need to try to reuse as well. Okay. And I'm just waiting for a little clarification on the last, on the next question here. Um, again, can you just like reiterate or go over um, what you just mentioned a little bit about the, uh, the, if the regular mask is placed on top of the actual disposable portion of the KN95? Right. Exactly. So you're basically wearing two masks. So you you are preserving the outer surface of your um, KN95 by actually putting your regular mask that you wear over that. Okay. Yeah, and I see that it actually did answer the question before it was even asked. So that was great. Um, and I think this is, can you touch on this too? Because I think you discussed, uh, this is from Dr. West. Um, will the face shield have the face shield have to be disposed after each patient? I mean, you you went into that a little bit, but can you expand? I did. Yeah. Um, again, we're in a contingency mode. If we weren't in a contingency mode, I would say, you know, it's marked single patient use. They're considered disposable. You buy them in a ten pack. All of those things. But we're in a different situation here, and I you can wipe them down. That's something that I would recommend doing in the, at this phase. You know, you want to clean them. I would have several of them and, and clean them between patients. That's just what you would want to do. So mm. I wouldn't say throw them away. You know, you're going to pay right now just to give you an idea. You're probably not going to find a facial for under five dollars. So just to give you uh, an idea of what you're paying before you waste a lot of time out there searching for them. They're expensive on the wholesale market. And, and I want to just go ahead and say this because I, I didn't mention it earlier. If you go to that Facebook page, you'll see my, my cover page kind of touches on this. But be kind to the people that are trying to source this PPE for you because we're all trying to do good for everyone. 
And a lot of times people get frustrated because there's a back order, something happens. It's it's kind of like the Wild Wild West days. I hate to say it, but it's like hmm. you you don't know who's you feel like everybody's out to get you and this person did this and that fell through and you're just trying to pull all the pieces together to make it happen for everybody and it doesn't always work out the way that you planned something gets canceled the, and shipments are supposed to come in and you've got a tracking number i have a friend of mine um, that has a business similar to mine and he has a, a twenty thousand dollar shipment that stuck was leaving china got stuck in japan and is sitting there in customs and has been there over a week because a plane a, a plane delay so these kinds of things are happening the volume is like insane of everything coming and going so just be kind and uh let the people that are trying to help you help you so any anything else we got there josh um, just double checking, making sure here. Again, we really appreciate everything you've done for us, Rose, and what you're doing for TDA members. This is really important information. Uh, I'm just going to go uh, just touch base, touch on this again, real quick. So, can you tell us how protective a face shield and a surgical mask is? Like, so, a face shield and a surgical mask, if you look at a surgical mask, there's three different levels. The level three has got a pretty uh, high level of bacterial filters in it and viral filters. It, they actually have that same meltdown fabric in a good surgical mask as well. I mean, I'm talking about one that is is a good rating by the U.S. rating, the a ASTM rating, I believe it is. So those ratings are there to protect you and there's the they all have different levels but that same level of protection you know you don't have quite the seal that you do with the n95 mask so you don't you know you don't have that uh, around your nose so if you've got a face shield on though that's offering you that level of protection over that surgical mask so you're not really getting anything directly on you so you just got to think about your environment and how you're protecting, you know, what's what, what are you breathing in? So that's where you're going with that is where you're breathing in. Can you tighten up that surgical mask a little bit? And I'm glad you asked this too. Uh, I wanted I didn't cover this and I meant to. The ear loop style mask that you're going to get, um, that's pretty much all that's available right now. Think about how can you make that tighter to your face? How can you secure it a little bit better around the back of your head? I've seen several different options with this uh, because everybody's head is obviously shaped different. You might put the ear loops on and you're like, man, this barely fits me. But you can pull those ear loops around the back of your head and I've even seen it done with like a paper clip. You pull them together and hold it together with a paper clip. There's also you know, a Velcro strap that you might just get that holds a, a computer cord together. You can wrap that around it to tighten it up. Anything that you can do to make it kind of, you want it to be tighter fitting to your face. So if you get those ear loops on and it doesn't feel secure, get a little MacGyver on it. You you guys can be resourceful <laughs> and figure it out. Okay. Um, so Rose, uh, again, so can you talk a little bit about air, air filtration and air filtration for the entire office as it would relate to this? That's something that you can is, touch on or? I, I can't personally touch on it as much. I do know that there is conversation on our Facebook group about it. Several people are okay. talking about it there. Um, it's probably a little bit out of my uh, wheelhouse to go into that in any, sure. any depth. I know that there are ways to uh, create negative pressure within a room, um, but it's, you know, and there's, shortcut ways to do it and long long ways to do it so you might want to check out that group and read what's being discussed there about it thank you rose um just an actual quick question here any recommendations on gowns yikes mm -hmm. gowns are very difficult and i'm gonna my recommendation is quit looking for disposable gowns <laughs> just stop looking you're, you are wasting your energy, your time, your breath, because I am looking through sources all the way into different countries. I mean, I, I actually hate to use the word China, but I am looking everywhere, including China, and they're just not available. 
and the ones that are, I mean, they won't even quote you on them. They won't even tell you that they're available. And I, I guess maybe there's more money in masks. I don't know. But the price that they want for a gown, wholesale price for a gown is like $8, from 6 to $8, depending on the quantity that you buy. And you guys know that they were 50 cents. The, the picture of on the front page of this has the thinner disposable gowns. Those are about 50 cents a piece, but you just can't get them. They're not out there. So I would start thinking in terms of reusable. There are some companies making reusable gowns that match the CDC guidelines. When I say that, you know, they're, they've got to be double seam so that nothing can get through the seam. There's several different aspects that you've got to go with there. I think they need to be made out of a polyester material, several things. But there are some companies, I believe in the US and maybe Mexico, that are making a disposable type gown, not disposable, reusable, so that you can wash them or auto, uh, autoclave them. And you know they're from $25 to $30 each. And those, you know, you're, you're just going to have to think about how you're gonna do that. One person said that they would just um, hire a laundry team to do, their, to do their laundry and just have them sent out like you would do a uniform. So think about it in terms of that. So you have a uniform company that you might hire to clean your gowns and have them sent out and have them be cleaned every week. But I would start thinking in terms of reusable, I would stop wasting all your energy and your effort trying to find disposable that's my advice. Okay, um, just got a little bit more time. Again, just uh, we're here to answer these questions. And again, I will I will be available to uh, if anyone needs anything on my end. I can certainly relay um, questions uh, after the fact to to Rose. This webinar is being recorded, so we're going to be able to send this out via email. Um, look for it next week. So again, we really want to thank Rose and her staff for everything they're doing here for TDA members. Really appreciate it. It's a very trying time for everyone. Um, and you can get in touch with me, Josh Epstein at jepstein at tda.org. Email me anytime or call me here at TDA 512-443-3675. I am at extension 161. Be sure to go back to our website, tdaperks.com. And if there are no more questions, Rose, did you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, not not exactly. Just to say thank you, everyone, for your time and just hang in there. You know, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It's been a long, long journey. And I want to thank you for your business. And my staff would like to thank you for your business. Um, they're able to keep working right now. And so your mask orders has actually made that happen. So, and just for the record, we don't want to be PPE long-term. We want to go back to the days of just talking about some <laughs> sedation monitors and selling a few AEDs here and there. So anyway, we'll, we'll talk to you guys soon. Feel free to reach out to, to our team at info at sedationresource.com. We will try to answer the phone, but it's a lot of calls these days. So uh, we will answer your email if you shoot us an email and we will return your call. So it might take us a while, but we will eventually get there. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you again, Rose. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.